Thank you, sir. All right, turn your Bibles, everybody, please, to Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Ecclesiastes chapter 6. We just started the book of Ecclesiastes on Wednesday, and we're all ready to chapter 6, because Brian flew through the first five chapters. That's the assignment that the syllabus had for him, so he didn't have a choice about that. But that was a lot to, uh, to cover, and he always does such a great job. Uh, he, he also uh, helped us understand the purpose behind the book. The book is about the vanity of life, vanity being the idea of meaninglessness, and there's just nothing we can do about that. The, this life is futile, and it's unpredictable, and it's difficult, and you, you just never know what's around the next corner, and you can't depend on this life and life under the sun for fulfillment and for happiness. You can't depend on it. And so what we need to do is serve the Lord. And at least when we serve the Lord, that helps us to see this world for what it is, life under the sun for what it is, and to appreciate the good times when they come and just remain faithful to, to God. So there are four discourses in the book. The first discourse, chapters 1 and 2, is about the, the fact that nothing on earth can be depended upon for fulfillment. The second discourse in chapters 3 through 5 is that we must depend on the sovereign God since we cannot understand His plan involving here, you know, life under the sun. We just can't, so we just need to depend on Him. The third discourse, which we're going to take a look at, we're going to study this morning, chapters 6 through 8, Solomon here defends his conclusions that he's reached. When people see the inequalities of life and the seemingly unfair variations in divine providence, they might say, well, how can there be a God with all that stuff going on? And so Solomon deals effectively with those objections in this section. There's no new material here um, from what we've already seen in, in chapters 1 through 5. There's a lot of repetition in Ecclesiastes in general, but what Solomon is doing here is he's tying up loose ends, and he is, he is leading to a grand conclusion that's really not all that grand when you think about it. It's just really simple. So, as we begin breaking this uh, down, first he talks about understanding apparent inequalities, starting in chapter 6 and going through midway in chapter 7. So, he talks about first the, the idea that uh, neither riches nor long life bring happiness. Let's read the first six verses of Ecclesiastes 6. He says, There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is prevalent among men, a man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor, so that his soul lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet God has not empowered him to eat from them, for a foreigner enjoys them. This is vanity and a severe affliction. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, however many they be, but his soul is not satisfied with good things, and he does not even have a proper burial, then I say, better the miscarriage than he, for it comes in futility and goes into obscurity. And its name is covered in obscurity. It never sees the sun, and it never knows anything. It is better off than he. Even if the other man lives a thousand years twice and does not enjoy good things, do not all go to one place. So, he, he's dealing with two things here, prosperity and long life. Those are a couple of things that you would think, man, that's, that's happiness right there. What he's saying is that those things are not always what they seem. People who have prosperity and long life, they're not always happy. Um, and same true for us. Just because we get prosperity doesn't mean we're going to be happy. You know, uh, sometimes we, we try to kind of fill all the blanks of life. Like, if I only had this, I'd be happy. And you have to ask yourself, what is the thing you would fill the blank with? And a lot of people would say money. Well, are all rich people happy? Well, Solomon was probably the richest man who's ever lived. And he saw that that was not the source of happiness. So we have to change the way we think about, about happiness. What really matters is the ability to enjoy life. You could have riches, you could have long life, but you're not enjoying life for various reasons. And here it says that God is the one who removes that ability to enjoy that, and that's an affliction. Let's look at verse 9. 
What the eye sees is better than what the soul desires. This too is futility and a striving after wind. I think that's such a great quote. What the eye sees is better than what the soul desires. In other words, be happy with the grass on your side of the fence. <laughs> you know, it may be that the grass on the other side of the fence is greener. Maybe it's not and you just think it is. But no matter what, the grass you've got right here, that's your grass. That is the grass you do have. And so enjoy that. Question, how does it help us to realize that neither riches nor long life can be relied upon for happiness? How does that help us? Jason? It's a little perspective, and it helps us to, to increase our joy, because if our joy is not dependent on how long I'm going to be on this earth, if my joy is not dependent on how many toys I collect, right. I learn to seek my joy elsewhere. And, and, and probably, uh, uh, using other passages, I, I seek my joy <coughs> in, in, in the things of God. Right. Yeah. Very good. Matt? Uh, I'm reminded of Paul when he said he learned to be content. Yes. Yeah. So that contentment is not the same as so even happiness. Right. It's learned. Right. So we, this reminds us to take a step back and be, you know, content with That's what right. you have and not always looking other people, other things, other places. <laughs> But we have to learn that. We have to learn that. Yeah, and in Philippians 4.11, I think he calls it the secret to contentment. He has learned the secret to being content. That's kind of what everybody's looking for. And uh, it, the, the secret is found in God. Yeah. Um, let's see. Let's do John and then Jeff and then Randy. and then uh, Jeff and then John and then Randy. I'm glad I know everybody's names. All right, go ahead, Mr. Jeff. I was just going to say, it should make us... Uh, not put our trust or our desire in those kind of things. There's a man who had those things, and he's saying that's not that's, right. that's not what you should be putting your trust in. Amen. So then, therefore, we should put our trust in, in, the, in heaven. That's Amen. Right. John? Uh, going back to the riches, sometimes people who have a lot of riches, where you've actually seen them happiest, is taking their riches and bestowing that to someone who may not have had a blessed life or a very rich life or been very profitable, but been but handing that over to, yeah. let's say, um, to someone you know of lower income so that they can have a better education. True. And to see that joy and happiness on yeah. that individual, you know, where they were able to get something and provide Great. for their family. Yeah. That's where I've actually seen, you know, like, rich, I'm using my air quotes here, right. you know, where they buy, now that's cool, instead of just building that bigger Yeah, bar. that's cool. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> very good. Randy? That's very similar. <coughs> One of the things I was going to say is, any rich people I've read about that were happy were the ones who were generous. John D. Rockefeller, in fact, He's gotten to the point where he can only crack his milk. His digestive system is so bad. And then he, he began giving out lots and lots of money, being very generous with money to regain his health. So it can have physical consequences, like I said. And as far as long life, I know, I, I know my step grandfather outlived both his sons. And when you live a long life, eventually a lot of the joy comes out of it because you lost loved ones, friends, you're kind of all alone in a sense. And it's not always that that's right. Moment. Yeah, and so that's that kind of leads into one thing I wanted to mention here on how that how it can help us realizing that those things don't bring happiness. It can help us not to feel jealous of people who have that. You know, because it might be easy to be jealous of people who have all these things that we don't have, but realize those things don't necessarily make people happy. All right. So, verses 10 through 12, what is good for man? This is the question that Solomon asks here. So the situation for mankind has always been the same. It's always been vanity here under the sun. We, we cannot argue with God about that, nor can we help the situation. It is what it is. What human being is there who really knows what is good for mankind? I think the idea is, you know, we might think it's better, for example... To never suffer. That would be the greatest existence. Or it, it's better to just be filthy rich. That's the better situation. But is it really necessarily better to never suffer? Is that really good for man? Is it really necessarily better to be filthy rich? Is that really good for man? We might think we know what's good, but 
Our Father in heaven is the one who only knows what's best for us. Now, having raised the question, what is good for man, Solomon then proceeds to give us some answers on some things that are better for man. These things are the opposite of what most people would think, the opposite of what you would expect. So there are seven things, actually, uh, I counted as I went down through these. The first one in verse 1 is a good reputation. Uh, let's go ahead and read that verse, a good name, chapter 7, verse 1. A good name is better than a good, than a good ointment, and the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. You see how that's the opposite? You would think the day of birth would be better than the day of death. But think about a reputation. What do they celebrate about a child when they're born? Well, 8.4 ounces, you know, 21 inches long, so forth, boy. Uh, in the day of one's death, what do they celebrate? What that person did. The maybe legacy that person left behind. That person's reputation. So... That there is much more meaning in that than just, hey, here's a, here's a new person that hasn't accomplished anything. That's kind of the argumentation that is here. The second thing that is better for man... Oh, I didn't mean to click. We're not supposed to click yet. So, uh, Hey, come back here. Stop. Okay. So the second thing is the house of mourning. Look at chapter 7 and verse 2. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting because that is the end of every man and the living takes it to heart. There are two things I used to really, I don't want to say hate because I tell my kids hate's not a nice word, but I kind of did. Uh, and th that's funerals and weddings. <laughs> and uh, I still don't enjoy weddings, but I go. But you, you, have, you have permission to not like weddings if you want to not like weddings. But to have an attitude about funerals that, you know what, I just don't do funerals. That's not a good attitude. Not that we need to get excited about going to a funeral, but it's profitable. Solomon says it's very profitable. It's better than going to a party. When you go to a funeral, or the house of mourning could, could be broader than just a funeral as we think of it, but... Uh, there's so much to learn from that in thinking about our own souls. All right. Number three, the third thing that's better for man is the rebuke of the wise. Look in verse 5, chapter 7, verse 5. It is better to listen to the rebuke of a wise man than for one to listen to the song of fools. Anybody in here like to be rebuked? You just kind of walk around looking for, man, I just can't wait till somebody comes up and just tells me what I've done wrong. It just, it's great. Nobody likes that. We, we'd rather just ignore our faults and just have a good time. Have a party. Listen to the singing of fools. But that's not, that's not wise at all. Because it helps us when someone points out our faults, because we may not have seen them, and now we can change. We can improve. So you see that there's some commonality here uh, between the second and the third things that, that are better for man, because they improve us. Number four is the end of a matter. That's better than the beginning of a matter because it's finished. You've seen it through. Uh, number five, letting go of anger is better for man. Number six, this is verse 10. I put it in my terminology, not wishing for the good old days. Oh, those good old days, everything was wonderful. Wait a minute. Was everything wonderful in the good old days? Was there always good and bad? We forget about the bad sometimes and, and we think about the good old days. Well, there's good and bad today and there was good and bad then. So don't long for the, the good old days. Be present today and be happy with the, the Lord's blessings. Verses 11 and 12, wisdom is better for man than just an inheritance. When you have wisdom combined with that inheritance, that will be a defense for man. Now I want to read verses 13 and 14. Obviously we, we could get into those in, in detail, but we don't have time. 13 and 14 says, Consider the work of God, for who is able to straighten what He has bent? In the day of prosperity, be happy. But in the day of adversity, consider. God has made the one as well as the other, so that man will not discover anything that will be after him. God made the world frustrating. He made the world that way, so that we can't figure out what's next. If we could, why would we need Him? But the point he's making here is God made this world bent. Nobody can straighten it. 
That's what everybody's trying to do. We're trying to straighten out this world. No, God made it vent. We can't straighten it. We need to quit trying to do that. All we can do, all we can do is enjoy the good times when they come. And when bad times come, consider and learn from those experiences. That's all we can do. We can't control it. The problem is, if we think that happiness always lies in other things than what we have or what we experience, then what's going to happen when the good times do roll around? And we're always looking for something else. We're not going to recognize it. We're not going to appreciate it, are we, Joy? We're not going to, we're not going to enjoy it. And so realize the good times when they come by appreciating them and, and then realize that they're going to be gone at some point and bad times are coming. That's such a powerful lesson. In the book, uh, The Happiness Advantage by Sean Acor, it's one of my all-time favorite books. If you've never read it, I highly recommend it. He's basically talking about uh, happiness as it relates to life under the sun is basically what he's talking about in that book. We kind of have it backwards where we think that success comes first and then happiness follows. That, you know, you've got to become successful and work hard and sweat and suffer. And eventually one day if you do that and, and, and then you live the American dream, then you can be happy. And that's messed up. We need to reverse that. We need to first realize that happiness precludes success. Successful people are people that have learned how to be happy. And that has just been shown in studies. Now, that's not exactly the point that Solomon's writing, but it's a similar point in that we don't need to be looking for happiness to be some far-off distant thing that maybe we'll get one day when you see that God has blessed us with the ability for that today. Now, here's a question for y'all. How do we distinguish between the YOLO, you only live once, message of Ecclesiastes with the you only live once message of Pepsi, of, of the world? and so forth. So they're both advocating, and there are many other passages in Ecclesiastes, to enjoy the moment. Well, that's the same thing that the world is telling us. Enjoy the moment. What's the difference? Let's see if anybody who hasn't answered has a comment first. Vanessa? Ma'am? One is with wisdom. Yes, with wisdom. You're enjoying things that maybe aren't enjoyable. Okay. But with the world, it's you just go and have fun and party. Good. For a caution to the wind, there right. are consequences. That's a great point. That's the case. So one is with wisdom, one isn't. Good. Phil? It's uh, enjoying yourself in the context of God under the sun, under Him, rather than apart from Him. Amen. The world wants to enjoy things without God. I think they can find it without Him. <laughs> Right. With him, they have that joy. So everything in life has meaning, has purpose, right. has joy to it, even in the pain. There's joy and pain, yeah. even in that. Yeah, that's a great point. And this life can be more enjoyable when you realize that this is not all there is. Well, right? when when you when you are serving God and you have faith in Him and in something more than this world. You see this world for what it is, and it does kind of free you up to just appreciate things for what they are and not try to put your anchor here, right? So that kind of goes along with that point. Phil? Yes, sir? I think the other thing is this. The world tells you to enjoy it because you're owed. Right. You're owed enjoyment. Right. It's high on it. For God, or in Ecclesiastes, he comes along and saying, you finally figure it out. Enjoy it because our Creator is blessing you. Amen. And you need to acknowledge that. Amen. Amen. Great, great point. All right, let me take one more. Jason? Going back to the point you made earlier is, is, is when he's showing those contrasts earlier in this discussion, um, he's redefining what we should take joy in. I'm not saying that we go to a funeral and we rejoice in it, but yeah. I think the point is that not everything that we like to do, we want to do, right. those things can often be folly. And he's distinguishing folly from serious things that, that produce positive, wise results in people who are trying to serve God. Amen. Like a funeral, providing that perspective that, one, we're not going to be here forever. We look at this person's legacy. What is my legacy going to be? Yeah, How do sure. I need to change so sure. it, 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 it's impacted? So yeah, there's, there's that kind of distinction. <laughs> and one more thought. We didn't really touch on sin. We touched on wisdom. But is it possible to have plenty of enjoyment in this life without sin? 
Yes. In fact, I think things will actually be more enjoyable in many ways because we won't bring upon ourselves the consequences of sin. So that's a difference too. Let's go now to the next, the next section, which is uh, assessing man's character. I'm sorry, I'm just way off on this thing. Now we're caught up. So he starts off here, verses 15 through 22 of chapter 7, talking about that we need to avoid extreme righteousness and extreme wickedness. I don't know how many hours I spent meditating and thinking and struggling over this particular passage, one of the most difficult passages in Ecclesiastes. Sometimes righteous people die, and sometimes wicked people prolong their lives. I'm just gonna, he kind of lays that foundation. That's true. Now, usually that's not the case. Usually the righteous person prolongs his life, and the wicked person dies you know, early and suffers the consequences, that sort of thing. That's generally the case, but, but that's not always true. Just look at the book of Job, right? Absolutely. So, having understood that, let's now look at verses 16 and 17. Let's read that. He says, Do not be excessively righteous, and do not be overly wise. Why should you ruin yourself? Do not be excessively wicked, and do not be a fool. Why should you die before your time? Boy, I struggle with this. So, first of all, understand he's not saying that we can have too much true righteousness or too much true wisdom. We need to heap that up. We need as much of that as we can get. I think he's, one thing he's doing is he's warning against going beyond what God requires. Narrow rigorism. Avoiding pleasures that God allows. Thinking we will find fulfillment there. That, you know, that's dealt with a lot in the New Testament. Like in Colossians 2, Paul said, If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you are living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use, in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men? These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. That's not going to help you at all in your service of God. And I'll add to that, it's absolutely vain. It's absolutely meaningless to do that to yourself, to go beyond what God requires. You know, there's another passage in, in 1 Timothy 4 where false teachers were forbidding what? Do you remember? Marriage. marriage. Forbidding marriage. Well, that's, that's not wise at all. That's not going to help us find meaning. So he's saying... Do not think that excessive righteousness, uh, Solomon is saying this, do not think that excessive righteousness is going to help you escape the vanity of this world. Different philosophies have sought to find meaning by doing that, like Stoicism. Well, it's, it's futile. It's futile. And the irony is, the irony is it actually leads to ruin. And that's the point that Solomon makes. It leads to ruin when you want to live that way. Now, let me add as a side point. I think he is talking about a false righteousness here. But even true righteousness is no escape from the vanity of this life. People think that Ecclesiastes is all about finding meaning in this life. That's not what it's about. That's not what it's about. It's about acknowledging, I can't find meaning in this life under the sun. But I'm going to serve God despite how vain this world is, and enjoy what I can in this, this life God has given me. So, he talks about extreme righteousness, but then on the flip side of the coin is extreme wickedness. So he's making the point that extreme excessive wickedness isn't the answer either. Now, he's not advocating lesser wickedness. It's not an argument for moderation and wickedness. But what he's saying is some people seek for meaning in life through excessive wickedness or indulgence. Peter talks about that in 1 Peter 4. For the time already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all this they are surprised that you do not run with them in the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. Any of us ever known people like this? Any of us ever been people like this? We think, that's where I'll find meaning. I'll just dive headlong into wickedness. Forget all this righteousness stuff. 
And you want to do that, that'll actually end your life quickly. We've all seen examples of that, haven't we? And that's the argument Solomon makes. I think that that's the sense that we, we are to get from this, this passage in uh, verses 16 and 17 of, of Ecclesiastes 7. Moving forward into verses 20 through 22, I love this. He says, don't expect people to be perfect, in essence. He's, he says, don't expect too much of others. You may hear your servants curse you. But then he says, don't forget what? You may have cursed others in your heart. The irony is, these people are this man's servants. What does that mean he has authority to do? Punish them for that. Even then, he's saying, realize that you're not perfect either. I love this. And it applies to so many situations. And I thought I'd ask everybody, can y'all just think of some specific kind of situations besides the, the master-servant relationship here that this attitude would really be beneficial with? To, to realize, you know what, not everybody else is perfect. I'm not perfect either. Can you give me some examples, specific situations where this might be beneficial? Let's see if anybody who hasn't answered has something first. Ms. Catherine? Absolutely. In marriage. In marriage. Oh, yeah. That's one that I actually wrote down here. Um, we become critical over every little thing, you know. She, she, she put the toilet paper on the wrong way or something like that. You know, that's just a, my, a very obviously minor thing. But, you know, every little flaw, every, every little um, mistake we're attacking them about. As if we don't ever make mistakes. Good. Any other situation? Joe? Parents, that's another one I had written down, yeah. Were we perfect children when we were children? Yeah, sure. <laughs> the answer is no. And so don't expect your children to be perfect either. All right, anything else? Can you give me a quick one, Brian? Ultimately, we, we do want to show people the better way, but if we're just all over them, and correcting every single one of their little sins that they're, I mean, Amen. they're all big, but I just, Amen. <laughs> we're not going to be able to, to reach them. They're, we're just going to push sure. them away. Amen. And with one another. Your brethren, hey, are not perfect. None of us are perfect. So don't expect one another to be perfect and come down hard on every single thing. That's a, just great practical advice. I have to move forward here. Wisdom's limits, verses 23 through 25. Solomon set out using wisdom to find the solution to life's problems. And he had more wisdom than anyone. But what did he find? No answers. No answers. It's impossible to find the answers and the solutions to life's problems. Now, in other places, Solomon exalts uh, and extols wisdom. But here he's warning against putting, putting too much stock even in wisdom. Because wisdom can only really take us so far. There is something, however, that Solomon had discovered... And that was the danger of immorality. So he then talks about that beginning in verse 26 of chapter 7. And he starts out here talking about the immoral woman. She's a horrible trap, more bitter than death. His main audience seems to be young men. In, in different ways we kind of gather that as we read Ecclesiastes. So he's warning men, escape her. That's good advice for men because sometimes men are just sitting ducks and they fall for that ungodly woman, maybe just because of the way she looks. And, and a man will make every excuse in the world. Oh, I'll convert her after we get married or something like that. And they, they fall for that woman and it, it sucks them in and it pulls them away from God. I have seen this. You have seen this. It happens so often. So Solomon says, this is what I've found. It's really hard to find a righteous man. But Solomon says it's impossible to find a good woman. Now, that's not a hit on women. That's Solomon's observation. And by the way, he had a thousand wives, and they weren't very helpful, were they, for Solomon? Just the opposite. They were just the opposite, right, Bill? So it, it, it's kind of the, an echo of Proverbs 31, 10, an excellent wife who can find, for her worth is far above jewels. The point is that good woman is almost impossible to find, almost impossible. So he's saying, young men, quit looking for the wrong women. Wait it out and look until you find that righteous woman. 
or it's better to have nobody. That, that's kind of, in essence, the message. In verse 29 of chapter 7, he says, Behold, I have found only this, that God made men upright, but they have sought out many devices. What a powerful verse. It's interesting that commentators uh, want to limit man or mankind to Adam and Eve. That God made Adam and Eve upright, but man has sought out many schemes. They don't want to say that's true for all people. And that's because they're trying to, to defend a false doctrine. But the word mankind means mankind in general. And the point is God made people pure, but they chose wickedness. Now let me ask you, I was kind of dancing around this, what modern false doctrine does 729 destroy? Sir? Calvinism. Calvinism, and specifically the T of the tulip. Anybody remember that? All right, total hereditary depravity is the false doctrine that children are born in sin. No, they are not. God made men upright. Sin is not a condition that you're born with. Sin is something you're guilty of when, when you pursue wickedness. Sin is something you commit. So that is a false doctrine. Babies are totally pure. And men seek out wickedness. Some, Bill? Some people baptize children. Yes. Because um, not a doctrine. That's right. That says that all have sinned and therefore babies are baptized. Right. And that doesn't seem to be. Not at all. Not at all. That's that's a great point you just made. Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Jack. Uh, factoid in regard to marrying a non-Christian. Uh, in church, a very large church, a number of people who to move on from there and go to other places, did a survey. And of the people who had married Christians, 76% of the couples were still faithful in attending services. Of the ones who were mixed marriages with a non-Christian, only 10% were. Interesting. That's very telling. Thank you for sharing that. So now we are to chapter 8. Chapter 8. And here Solomon talks about in the first nine verses, he talks about wisdom living under governmental authority. It's foolish for people to try to solve the inequalities of life by attempting to overthrow the government and the king. I mean, that's why life is so terrible. It's, it's this government. If we could just fix the government, life would be great. Any Americans ever have that attitude? Surely not. Way <laughs> back. Yeah, so this is, a, this is an attitude that's, that's been had for a long time, right? Uh, only we don't live under a monarchy, and so you know we're not going and trying to overthrow our our ruler and rulers. We have elections to overthrow them every so many years. Um, but back then, that wasn't the case. And you had very, a, a very common repetition of overthrows of government and kings. In fact, we see that in, in the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah, do we not? Absolutely, we do. So look at 8 and verse 2. He says, I say, keep the command of the king because of the oath before God. Now, I'm just going to pause there. In that day, you made an oath before God that I'm going to serve the king. Now, if you made an oath to serve the king, what if you don't like the king? Too bad. You made an oath before God. Now, let's just kind of pause here and, and go on a tangent. We can apply that concept to lots of stuff. You made an oath. Stick to it even if you don't like it. What can you think of that applies here very obviously? Marriage. Well, I just don't love her anymore. It's too hard. Times aren't fun anymore. Well, for richer, for poor, you know, for life. Through, well, however it said it, I forget it. <laughs> it was important, but I remember it and then I can't recall it. But the point is... you. You, that's really bad, I know. I'm going to hear about that. 
You make that oath before God and stick with it for life, even if it's difficult. Even if it's difficult. And we could probably think of other situations too. Matt, do you have one? 100% agree with you. However, God did not intend there to stay miserable. No. So that's, you're 100% correct. However, that's to tell you something needs to be addressed. Yes, that's absolutely. It's hard and it may be wrong and painful to fix it. That's right. But be careful of the mindset, well, I just got to live in this misery. There's something, something is amiss. You're right. No, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. But of course, the point being, you make this covenant related, you make this oath before God. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Good point, though. And uh, we do need to work on that in our marriages. So he goes on to talk about, do not rebel against the king just because he doesn't do what you please. He's the king. He does what he pleases. So the advice is obey him and you'll stay out of trouble. That's the advice. And again, while we don't live under a monarchy, there is a lesson here for us. And that is we need to be a law-abiding citizen, not be one who tries to rebel against that. In uh, Romans 13, Paul said, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. So we'll move now to the conclusion. The conclusion to this third discourse, which uh, begins in chapter 8 and verse 10. He argues here that wickedness is of no avail. And so let's look there in verses 12 and 13. Chapter 8, verses 12 and 13. Although a sinner does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his life, Still I know that it will be well for those who fear God, who fear Him openly. But it will not be well for the evil man, and he will not lengthen his days like a shadow, because he does not fear God. His argument here is that ultimately wickedness gets you nowhere, even though it may appear that's not the case. That's the truth. Wickedness will ultimately get you nowhere. In fact, it'll get you destroyed in the end. Now, I think another point we can draw from this is that the reason for so much inequality in this world, so much of the vanity under the sun, is free will. Man brings so many of these problems upon ourselves by choosing to rebel against God. Corrupt government is just one example. The way that people choose to rebel against corrupt government is, a, is another example. Consequences for sin. Any thoughts you guys want to add to that or questions about that? I think realizing free will really helps us to resolve a lot, not all, but a lot of the apparent inequalities um, in this life under the sun. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a good distinction you're making too because when we say that God cursed the earth with sin, it's not like, okay, God did it. He cursed the earth and so now we're just living in this cursed place because of what God did. Well, actually, we perpetuate the curse every day by continuing to disobey Him and all those consequences that we have to suffer because of it. Yeah, we are part of the, we, we are part of the problem because we're sinners. We are the problem. We are the problem. <laughs> That's true. That's a better way to say it. Good. Ma'am? Sorry. Um, we're the problem, but we've been given the answer. That's right. We've, we've been given the an answer. answer. That's right. And it comes down to serve God. And that's exactly where we're going here next. So let's look in verses 14 and 15 of chapter 8. He says, this is, There is futility which is done on the earth. That is, there are righteous men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. On the other hand, there are evil men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I say that this too is futility. So I commended pleasure, for there is nothing good for a man under the sun except to eat and to drink and to be merry, and this will stand by him in his toils throughout the days of his life which God has given him under the sun. 
Point being here, we can acknowledge that there are things we don't understand about the way things work. But we have enough insight about the workings of God to trust that He knows what He's doing. Isn't that helpful to realize we don't have to figure it out? God's got it figured out. He knows what He's doing. And just always keep that trust. Therefore, we can commit our life to the Lord and enjoy the blessings that this life affords, even the smallest of blessings, the simplest of blessings, realizing that these blessings, uh, as our visitor mentioned earlier, they come from God. Absolutely. Well, I have done something unprecedented, and I have finished my material several minutes before we're finished, which is great. I always aim to do that. But it's a little risky because I don't know how many comments might be made or not made. So y'all jump in, and I want to hear any thoughts, comments, questions from anything we studied uh, today. I'm going to wait and see if anybody has an answer to, has something they want to say first. Just give everybody an opportunity. Carol? I think it is in man's nature to want to contain and explain the things that are in a box. Yeah. I think that through the study of some... Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, we see, or Job, I meant, we see that happening, especially with Job's friends. They really try to contain God's Word. Mm -hmm. And I think we as Christians also sometimes try to contain God within this book. And I think what all of this is saying is God is bigger than this. <coughs> the fear of God the thing can say to us. He's bigger than this book. This is just what he's chosen to reveal. About himself. But it's not just that. It's more than that. Yeah. Deuteronomy 29 and verse 29, the things that are revealed uh, belong to us and our children, but the secret things belong to God. And I think that's yeah. all this wisdom literature is getting. Yeah, great. Mr. Bill. But basically, wow. Well, True. There's many things God has told us. But for sure, He's told us what we need to do. That's right. And, and that's that's great. And that goes right along with Ecclesiastes that we, we can't figure everything out, but we do know what really matters, and that is trust in God and serve Him. Be faithful to Him. Very good. Brian. Yeah, certainly physically we don't live in a monarchy, but I love to apply eight, uh, chapter 8, 2 through 4 to Jesus, you know, because as Christians we made an oath to follow him, you know, we gave our lives to him in baptism. And I love when he says, since the word of the king is authoritative, who will say to him, what are you doing? And yet so many people disagree with what Jesus says in Jesus' word. And you can't do that. I was kind of going to go there, but my, I was so rattled by my mistake earlier, my brain was reeling and I, I couldn't get my thoughts together. And everybody was laughing at me. No. <laughs> it's okay. We laugh together. Randy? You were asking for examples of first uh, person or your servant they curse you and et cetera. I reminded me of what John Malloy said in his book, Went to Success. He said, if you talk to your coworkers about how the boss's son is the dumbest guy in the company, at that point, the boss's son is no longer the dumbest guy in the company. Ooh. <laughs> Good point. Good point. All right, we've got just a minute, a little over a minute left. Somebody else's hand over here? Matt? I was just thinking, kind of going back to Brian's part, that this is kind of Bob Joe's friends. You know, to me, this is very validating in the sense of, is a term to help develop the gospel of Joe's friends. Oh, things are bad, you must have messed up. You know, but your life is really rough. Some people's lives are just really, really rough. Yeah. It doesn't mean you're bad. Expect exactly. like it's okay. Not yeah. that it's okay, but it's okay, if that makes sense. Like yeah. expect things to be rough, whether it's your whole life, or part of your life, it does God is still God. Yeah. God is still okay with you. You can still serve God. That's right. Don't beat yourself up that the excessive righteousness, like, oh right. I must be awful, I'm a horrible person. And don't know him and say, oh, it doesn't matter. I can't be perfect, so just go crazy. Yeah. Either way. That's right. Expect things to be good and yeah. bad. And just kind of roll with it. And then God's in charge. Absolutely. Amen. Phil? Oh, they say that hindsight is 2020, looking back. So that means that looking forward, all we can do is look through the eyes of faith, Amen. hold on to God, Amen. realizing that we don't see 2020. And in the end, we will. 
and we'll see all the meaning, and we'll see all the purpose, and we'll see all the plans, and we'll see all the work that God did in our life that brought it all together. Our trouble is we want a 2020 without faith. We want to be able to see it all now. That's right. And that takes away, and it's the same with God. God is always going to be a mystery to us until he reveals all of himself to us. That's right. The Bible is only a special revelation, a very limited, fragmented part of who God is. Right. When we get home and we see him as he really is, he's going to continue to reveal himself to us in his fullness, but he's going to give us the ability to be able to understand it on a level then that we can't now. Amen. I can't think of a better way to end the class. Thank you for that comment. Uh, please read through page 212 for Wednesday. <laughs>